Good morning. How are you all? I'd like to thank you all for coming. This is uh, So Happy Together Project Management. Project Management Managers and Content Strategists are. Um, uh, I'd like to thank DrupalCon for selecting me to come share my experiences with you. Um, we're going to do some housekeeping and then uh, look at content-related risks uh, before diving into a detailed look at some steps that you can take uh, on the projects that you might be working on right now, um, wherever it is that you guys are working, um, to sort of mitigate those risks that content um, creates when you're, when you're designing and building and rolling out content management systems. I am uh, a huge fan of Drupal. I work with it quite often. This is not going to be uh, much like Karen uh, mentioned this morning. This isn't just about uh, Drupal. This is about content strategy and project management and how they work together. I am a project manager, and I absolutely love content strategy and content strategists, and so hopefully that will come across. Before we do get started, I want to uh, quickly mention that there's, a, there's an update on what's going on in the, uh, the coding room next door. Um, the FEMA folks are organizing some Drupal uh, developers. And hopefully this works. We have a URL. It's helpforok.org. .ok um, I talked to one of the project leads. The biggest thing that they can use right now is something that anybody can do. You don't have to be a coder or a developer. Um, it's to promote it, to talk about it. And so you should feel free to do that um, often. Uh, I think it's pretty incredible that something you know disastrous would, could happen. And this community is just like right there and jumps on it. I think that speaks. Uh, very loudly about the Drupal community. So helpforok.org, -ok check it out, share it with your friends and colleagues and stuff. My name is Jake. Um, there are resources for this, uh, for this session at uh, our website, cmsmyth.com slash DrupalCon 2013. The hashtags are DrupalCon and so happy. Uh, and you can, you can connect with me on Twitter at Jake Damari and CS, CMS Myth. Um, the blog is the CMS Myth. And I, I definitely encourage you to connect with me. I really do enjoy uh, sharing thoughts and, and ideas about our industry and about the work that we do. And so uh, please do connect with me. Before we get go any further, I would like to know, uh, get a sense of who's in the audience so I can try to gauge things appropriately. So um, what, real quick, by show of hands, how many project managers do we have in the room right now? OK. Do we have any content strategists? I love you guys. What about developers? OK. Designers? All right, that's about what I had figured. Any digital strategists? Awesome. Uh, so really big question. How many people here think content strategy is vitally important to the work that they're doing now and believes it's going to help them build world-class digital experiences? Awesome. My job is done. We're all good. We can go now. <laughs> Um, so this is the company I work for during the day. It's called Eyesight Design. We have an office here in Portland, and the office where I work is in, in Boston. Um, we are very interested and excited about building world-class digital experiences, uh, not just websites. And we're going to talk more about that this morning and how content strategy rolls up to this idea of a digital experience. I'm also a contributor to the CMS myth. Um, this is my passion. Uh, I love talking about content strategy and content management systems and the work that we do. Um, and the CMS myth is really interesting. We're not uh, uh, like a group of CMS analysts. We don't typically talk about any one platform, although this particular article that's up here on our homepage that day was about WordPress. Um, we, we, don't, we don't have like a favorite platform. We're, we're technology agnostic. But what we do have is a strong perspective that technology is nothing without humanity and that you are the content management system or you're certainly an integral part of that. And so before I get started on my session, we wanted to give away some, some, uh, some swag. And what I have here is this t-shirt, this and it says, I am the CMS on it. I'm also wearing one myself. Um, and what we're going to do is, if for all of you that have your, your phones handy and your computers handy, if you're on Twitter or if you have TweetDeck or Hootsuite open, I would like you to prepare to type something into Twitter. And then uh, the first five people to get this message out on Twitter will, will, uh, can, can see John after the session, my, my colleague down there. And we'll get you one of these t-shirts. So here's the message. We're so happy with content strategy at DrupalCon PDX. And John, you're not eligible to win. <laughs> Glad I have my water nearby. I don't want to have a Marco Rubio moment during this session. 
Um, so some quick level setting. As I mentioned, I'm primarily a project manager. I'm not a content strategist. And this is the session is about my experiences. Um, I, I'm on the agency side, so I, t I use the words client often. I'll try to use the word stakeholder because I know there's probably some folks here that work for the organizations that I typically think of as clients. Um, but what I'm about to talk about, like Karen mentioned this morning and, and what Dries was talking about yesterday, this is applicable to anybody. It doesn't matter if you're a project manager or a content strategist. The chances are that you're dealing with these issues. And, and what I hope to share is that content strategy is like design, right? And, and in the early days, we didn't really take design very seriously. I remember when I got started, um, it wasn't the most important thing because we were all struggling with the technology. Um, and, and, and over time, design became more important and usability became more important. And I hope that you all are starting to understand at this stage in the development of, of communicating online, content strategy is becoming very important. It's something that's going to happen on your projects. The question is, do you want it to happen intentionally or do you want it to be like that decision that gets made by the engineer at the last second uh, before a site goes live? I'm not going to uh, evangelize too much. I want to be, uh, you know, this is going to be more practical practical and hopefully some of the things that Karen talked about this morning, we're going to break them down and show you specifically how to do these things on your projects. But that being said, just in case there are any folks in the room who missed Karen's talk and haven't been keeping up with the content strategy movement, I do want to quickly share the idea that it is a really big deal right now. And my own personal acknowledgement of this fact has followed a similar trajectory to our industry from initial awareness to the present. But for me, there was a, a watershed moment last year when I saw this tweet from the Mars Curiosity rover. If it's tough to read, it says, I'm safely on the surface of Mars, Gale Crater, I am in you, uh, hashtag MSL. Some of you might be thinking, so what, right? Like the person responsible for tweeting updates about the recent landing that happened that day on Mars was probably just a little bit excited and they got away from themselves and they, they changed the voice, the editorial voice of what they were supposed to be tweeting, which you know, five years ago, it might have made more sense that if there was a, a rover on another planet, that it would probably just be spitting out hard data. Um, but in fact, if you were to go to, uh, go to the Curiosity's Twitter feed, you're, you'll see that that assumption is incorrect. In fact, it's almost immediately evident that the Mars Curiosity rover Twitter feed has a distinct editorial style. It's meant to be fun and approachable. On a strategic level, I speculate someone made a very specific choice that this feed should inspire wonder and gain the interest of normal everyday citizens who vote for the politicians that make decisions about how to fund scientific exploration. And that this hunk of battery powered robot drilling holes in a frozen ball of dirt 50 million miles away from Earth should have a content strategy fills me with a sense of wonder at the importance of what we do. Um, human beings like stories and they transfer from person to person like energy uh, far easier than cold hard data. Um, someone made a decision that the Mars rover should have a personality that the, through the exercise of that very intentional content strategy, the Mars rover should be a star. And this all rolls up to, you know, one small part of, of NASA's overall digital experience, which has changed very dramatically over the last couple of years. So I would like to say thank you to Karen McGrain and Jeff Eaton and Margot Bloomstein and the rest of the evangelists that have been working so hard to get this idea out to us who are practitioners day to day. It's my genuine belief that content strategy helps me and the teams I work with provide better digital experiences. Um, and this is about digital experiences. That being said, the promise of better digital experiences is, is really great and all, but um, it's also my belief that content strategy makes my life as a project manager a heck of a lot easier. And so I'll demonstrate why with the remainder of this presentation. We're going to change gears and, and talk and get a little bit more practical and, and we're going to talk about seven content related risks that may take your project off the rails and then dig into ways that you can mitigate these risks. In order to understand how content strategy makes the life of a project manager easier, uh, why I and all project managers should really love content strategy, it's necessary to better understand the mind of an average project manager. What are our fears and motivations? What are the kinds of things that we think about while we're working? Uh, uh, hopefully, this is what you're thinking about um, when you work. I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into each of these areas one at a time. So scope, right? Uh, this is how we measure projects, and it's, it's very important. I think we all know that. Um, building websites is interesting. It's not like building a house. I can't measure the scope and square footage. I can't 
you know, enumerate the types of flooring material that I'm going to use or what fixtures I'm going to use in the kitchen. We have to come up with sort of unique ways to measure the scope of something that's, it's, it doesn't exist. It's vapor until we create it, right? It's just an idea. Um, and so scope, obviously something that project managers think about a lot. Schedule, um, what can I say? There's the milestones and sort of the, the deliverables on a project, but then there's also the, the challenge that all the project managers in the room know about of getting, people's, uh, getting people together and getting their calendars coordinated. So that's uh, you know, scope and schedule and, and also budget. These are kind of the block and tackling of project management. And there's, there are the things that we learn how to deal with first, and there's not a lot of interest there and probably not, uh, certainly not what we're going to talk about today. Stakeholder expectations, puppies and rainbows. We don't have to talk too much about that. The one I want to talk a lot about is managing risk. Um, when I put risk into Google image search, this is what I got. I'm guessing that in Europe, there's a significant risk that giant birds are going to poop out cars. <laughs> uh, so I, in addition to building uh, digital experiences, I study uh, martial arts, specifically Brazilian jiu-jitsu. The first thing that we learn uh, when we're learning to, to fight in this style, uh, and I think in many martial arts, is that it is necessary for you to face your problems, right? Uh, most people, when they get into a physical altercation, their instinct is to turn away and, and, and run. And when you're in a competitive martial art, you can't turn away and run if you expect to win very often. You need to face your problems. And for me, this was something that resonated because it was one of the first things I learned as a project manager, is that it was necessary for me to think through uh, how things were going to turn out on the projects that I was working on and face those problems. In jiu-jitsu, there are many problems we must face, but the biggest one that we talk about a lot is that we may get submitted by our opponent who is trying to choke us unconscious. And we call that very literally being choked out. We use that term a lot. You don't want to be choked out when you're fighting in jiu-jitsu. In project management, we call the, 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 the act of facing our problems risk management. And so, what I'd like to do in the spirit of mixed metaphors is talk about the seven ways the content can choke out your project. The first one, let me get a sip of water, is failure to appreciate the depth and breadth of a project. So we talked earlier about scope, and uh, one of the things that I want to sort of get across is that scope, schedule, client expectations, budget, those things roll up to risk, and it's, it's risk that if we're, if we're spending time thinking about risk, then we're thinking about all these things. Content equals scope. Uh, this is the Zakem Bridge in Boston. It's part of the famous Big Dig or Central Lottery Project. Planning started for it in 1982, um, and it was the most expensive highway project in the history of mankind to this day. It was originally scheduled to be completed in 1988 or 1998 at an estimated amount of 2.8 billion dollars. Um, 2.8 billion with a B. It eventually was completed in 2007 at a number of 14.6 billion dollars. Uh, I did the math, and if you calculate the uh, inflation, that's a cost overrun of 190 percent, which is pretty significant. And I know most project managers in the room can probably say with a high degree of certainty that if we consistently delivered projects that were 190% uh, over budget, that we would not be project managers for very long. Uh, there are other problems associated with, uh, with projects getting out of bounds and sort of gr the uh, scope creep and scope issues, and they have to do with uh, wearing out the teams that we work with. And that, and that team fatigue is a very serious problem that we all have to take into consideration. And so we're going to talk a little bit later about how content relates to scope and what are the tools we can use to mitigate that risk that content is going to, uh, to choke out your project with scope. So uh, the second one I'd like to talk about is failure to recognize the critical importance of content. Failure to recognize the critical importance of content. It seems silly to have to say this, um, but it is all about the content. The reason why users make a decision to go to website A versus website B is because of the content that's contained there. It doesn't matter how usable your experience is. It, in fact, I can, I could, we don't have time for it, but we could rattle off lists of hundreds or thousands of websites that have content experiences that are absolutely horrific and they're in some of the most trafficked websites uh, in the world. And it's because they have content that users are looking for. So this is the, the homepage of the CMS myth 
arguably there are still things left here that I would say are content, but it's a sort of debatable topic. I think the things that I've stripped away, it's fairly obvious that it's the copy, it's the images, and it's the sort of meta information about them. Uh, without that, what do we have? We have nothing. So everything we do is about content. It's about creating con containers for this content. And so uh, I think it's really important to recognize that failure to recognize that critical importance of content is a big risk. Number three, failure to plan for creating and or revising content. So I am uh, actually about two weeks away from deploying a site um, for, for a major university. Um, and uh, this is a really exciting project. It's been going on for 18 months. Um, and at this, the, during this entire process of designing a new web experience for them, a responsive front end experience on a new content management system, um, and reshuffling their information architecture and, 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 and all the stuff that we think about all the time. We think about my client in the meantime is deciding content that they don't want anymore, figuring out what content they need to rewrite, and writing new content. And that is a phenomenal amount of work. And it's all happening in parallel with what my team is doing, which is designing and building and working out, you know, marketing optimization and all that kind of stuff. And there's a point, and I happen to be in the middle of it right now, and I probably have 5,000 emails, <laughs> where the content that my client was generating is merging with this web experience that my team is building. And, and I can tell you that when that is done, that is what the, con the client or your stakeholders, if you work, at, you know, if you're on an internal team, are going to be most concerned about. And it's where a lot of things are going to surface. A lot of problems are going to surface. And so we're going to talk more uh, when I get into the sort of the solutions about what you can do to mitigate the risk that, you know, failure to recognize how difficult it is to create content and to revise content um, can be. Failure to understand the challenges of designing with dummy content. Uh, so I see this one a lot. Laura Ipsum, I'm going to read this, is simply dummy text of the printing and typesetting industry. It has been the industry standard dummy text ever since the 1500s, right? We're in the 21st century. We're building digital experiences that need to be available across multiple form factors. And still to this very day, on projects that I am personally working on, I catch designers using Laura Ipsum as the primary source of content while they're designing. This is a big problem, right? It's okay to use Lauren Mipsum if it's all you have and you need something to fill the space, but it's not okay if you don't have access to some of the real content that's gonna be used in the experiences that you're building. We need to understand the context of the content that we're designing. We need to understand the length of real lists, the length of titles, the length of navigation items, and the list goes on, sorry. I'm struggling with allergies. And so, it's not really appropriate uh, to use Lauren Mipsum for the only, as the only source of content while you're designing web experiences. Number five, failure to properly plan for content migration. Failure to properly plan for content migration. There's a guy uh, in Boston who created an entire career around uh, content migration for Drupal. Um, he works for Acquia now. Um, it's a big deal, right? Getting content from the sources that subject matter experts or copywriters are writing into, um, or from old content management systems into the new systems that you're designing and building is very complicated. I love this image. Um, it's very sort of optimistic and aspirational. I can kind of imagine myself as the project manager in that ultralight guiding my, my flock of geese or cranes or whatever those those birds are from, from point A to point B. And we could kind of imagine that this is like what a content migration experience might be like under ideal circumstances. Um, but <laughs> I'm imagining that this might feel more realistic to, to anyone in the room. Content migration is hard. It's difficult. Uh, and it's a huge client risk. We talked earlier about um, you know, clients having a lot of anxiety about the fact that they're writing or revising content at the same time that you're developing the, the container for it. Excuse me. Um, this is another one of those things that is going to keep your stakeholders up at night. And if you want to be a real sort of Jedi, um, you can make it easier for them. So we'll, we'll talk about how. Um, the time it takes to move content into a website is a very uh, a, a big deal, and it requires careful planning. Number six. 
failure to plan for the disruptive effects of owning a new content management system. Um, so I'm from Boston, I mentioned earlier, and uh, I can tell you that uh, in Boston, we love to go to Fenway Park for Red Sox games. And uh, the weather patterns in Boston being is, as they are during the summer, it's quite frequent that storms will roll in from the west right around the time the sun is going down, which is right around the time that you finally got to your seat, and you've got your, your Coors Light and your, uh, and your popcorn, and you're ready to see the game get started, and this happens. And I, I mean, this is something that all human beings can identify with. Like, we do not like delays. Um, and and if, you're, if you're not planning for the disruptive effects of owning a new content management system, and I don't care if that means your client's going from WordPress to Drupal, or if they're going from an old installation of Drupal to a new one, uh, this is disruptive. This is going to cause problems, and it's going to keep people awake at night. Um, I, I, sometimes being a project manager, it's like being a therapist, right? When you get to that stage with your clients where you have a great relationship, like, Learn to help the content writers and the people that are interacting with the system understand that you're in their corner, you've got their back, and that you're there to help them uh, when, when they take ownership of this new CMS. And we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit more later about how you can do that. Nobody likes game off. Failure to understand the gravity of business requirements. So at iSight and at, at the CMS Myth, we, uh, we use this this uh, diagram often when we're talking to folks about digital strategy. Um, we call it the seven gates for digital change. And what I like about it, how I thought it was relevant to, to this session today, is that it sort of puts things in their proper place, right? Content, optimization, technology, which Drupal would fall into that circle, culture and governance, vision, et cetera. These are all just small parts of the overriding sort of goals that businesses have. Um, and and what, what I've learned over time is that in order to go from, you know, being a project manager that does one-off projects and then those clients go away and I don't ever talk to them again, to being a project manager who's becoming a consultant for my clients and is having long-term relationships with them, a big difference was understanding that businesses have goals and that's really what I'm there, right? I'm there to help them solve the problems that are standing between them and achieving their goals. So what can we do to mitigate these risks of uh, content choking out our projects? Um, well, the first thing you could do is hire a content strategist, right? That, that would be easy. Um, I've noticed there are a lot of women in content strategy. I don't know why there is. There's also a lot of women in project management. I'm the only male project manager at my office. Um, and to help make the case for uh, the importance of simply adding this team member, I want to take a quick, very quick sort of walk through my own experiences um, growing up within this industry. Um, Karen mentioned this earlier. This is the original web page put up by CERN um, on April 30th, 1992. Um, obviously, it's not a very sophisticated website. As revolutionary as this was, when we look back on it now, it seems kind of silly and, and simple. Um, and it is compared to today. Um, this is not a picture of me, but Back then, I was a webmaster. I had a, uh, I was the webmaster for a brick and mortar company, and this was the kind of, this was the person that would be responsible for man managing and maintaining a website like this. You had a message that you wanted to get out on the website, you would get, bring it to your webmaster, he would put it up on the page, and that was how it worked, right? Simple. We weren't thinking about design, we didn't have to wrestle with images, we had no video, there were no mobile devices, so on and so forth. Um, fast forward to year 2000, this is the Apple homepage. Um, as you can see, design obviously playing a much bigger role. Uh, we still hear this today. Clients come to us, they say, I want my design to be like Apple, clean, lots of white space, you know. Um, fortunately, nobody asks for the jelly buttons anymore. They've been sufficiently put to bed. Um, as you can see, uh, there are some other important details here. One of them is images, right? Another one is video, the QuickTime. Uh, I don't know if anyone remembers back in 2000, QuickTime, people were starting to actually watch videos online. And it was really exciting and interesting. And it was something new that we had to, we had to wrestle with. So around that time, I became a web developer. And I was paired with a web designer at the, at the at, it was actually a traditional advertising agency that was starting to offer digital services to their clients. And myself and this designer would basically get work, uh, sort of business requirements from an account executive. And we would run off and try to make it work. And 
bring something back to them and they would say, no, that's all wrong. And we would do something else and bring it back to them and they'd say, no, that's all wrong. And then finally the account executive would say, that's it. And then they would bring it to the client and we would start all over again. The client would say, no, that's wrong. And we would go back and forth. And it wasn't very profitable, but we knew we all had to be doing it um, because it was the direction that everything was going. Um, 2005, this was actually, this was a Webby Award winner, pretty typical um, web experience. What's really important here that I want to point out is that we've got this, uh, we've got this rate finder application, this policy login application, a lot more content. We've got video integrated with the experience. Um, we also have this, the, the very beginning idea of like giving the website uh, an experience or a voice that matched the organizational brand um, with the, the, the lizard, the Geico lizard saying vote for me. Um, and uh, also, by this time, for, for organize, the kind of organizations that I was working with, static content is dead. We're all on content management systems now. Um, we're starting to dabble with uh, personalized, localized content um, delivery. And uh, things are getting a lot more complicated. We're also beginning to wrestle with the very first wave of smart mobile devices around this time, um, like the Palm Treo and uh, the original Blackberries. So, a few years earlier, Jacob Nielsen and Jeffrey Zeldman had worn out the conference circuit. Um, and by 2005, all anyone could talk about was usability. Um, and so we sort of added to this team uh, of necessary folks um, an information architect, which soon became known as user experience architect. I'm going to speed things up a little bit. With teams getting bigger, we also needed the addition of project managers. Um, and so we've got uh, the Jedi King of Middle Earth there, that's the project manager. Um, I, you know, I added that in as kind of obviously to be a little bit funny, but I, I want to point out once again that this is about my experiences. Um, at, in 2005, you may have been a one-person team, um, or you may today be a one-person team that's, that's building absolutely brilliant digital experiences, designing, doing content strategy, and building, especially in the Drupal community, we find that to be true. There's some very talented folks. You may also have been working for a company like Geico that had hundreds, if not thousands, of people maintaining their website. <coughs> But these are kind of the essential roles that you would expect to see. <clears throat> so present day digital experience team, we don't really uh, have just developers anymore. We have engineers and front end developers and experienced designers and architects and project managers and digital strategists and marketing and optimization specialists and content strategists, it goes on and on and on. The web is getting incredibly more complex. And to define success today, uh, your, ex your experience is not your website. Uh, your content needs to be targeted, portable, mobile, social, responsive, local, global, relevant. I don't know if anybody was here for Rally's talk last night, but there was a few more terms that could be added to this. Um, point is that we're not just thinking about screens anymore, like Karen talked about this morning. <clears throat> and at the same time, let's not forget the significance and influence of search results, which has been growing steadily right alongside the complexity, the complexity of digital experiences for this entire time. Uh, content teams now, and have for many years, need to think about how content is consumed by algorithms, not just human beings. And, and, and so uh, another place where content strategy obviously plays a major role. So. <coughs> What can you do if you don't have access to a digital strategist? Which is a very real possibility, especially for folks who are working on smaller teams. Um, then, it, then it's necessary to make sure that in your project lifecycle, you're including the right um, activities and milestones and deliverables. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to take a look at a few of those right now. The first one that I like to talk about is a content audit. Right? This, is a, this is a specific step that you can take on projects that you're currently involved with. Um, a content audit is a detailed content inventory and associated analysis. The best time to do it is during scoping or, or discovery. Um, and this talks about, we, you know, we talked earlier about scope-related risks associated with, with a project. Um, scoping is, you know, it, it would be the best time to do a content audit before you ever sign agreements with anyone or before you set expectations about what you can deliver. It's a good idea to know how much content you're talking about, right? The reason why we do this is to reduce the cone of uncertainty, right? If, if I say I'm going to, you know, if you come to me and say I want a website and I say, okay, I'm going to give you a website and we don't have any conversation about how big it is, there's a pretty good chance that I'm setting one or both of us up for failure. Um, and so the way that we do a content audit, 
this is project management porn right here. Um, I love spreadsheets. And this is a very detailed spreadsheet. It's got like seven or eight tabs down the bottom of there, and they all have tons of deep content. Um, this output is created by an automated tool, which uh, I have up on the resources page for this session. It's called Xenu, Xenu Link Sleuth. We, we just call it the Xenu Report. If you're not familiar with it, I, it is indispensable. I highly recommend it. Xenu Link Sleuth goes out to a URL that you provide it, and it gathers an incredible volume of information about that, uh, that website. However, um, you're not done there. Uh, in order to, be, to do a good content audit, you should, uh, you should not just run automated software, but you should uh, then take that, that data that you get, that you receive from Xenu, and you should analyze it. And when you analyze it, it should be a group conversation. You definitely should include user experience architects, designers, marketing and optimization folks, and, and, and business stakeholders in the analysis of that, that data. Um, you should look for you know, pockets of abandoned content, and you should compare the content that you get from Xenu against analytics. Why, and so the reason why I would do that right, is that um, it's, it's always amazing when uh, clients or stakeholders, they have these pages and they think they're so important, right? They're like, this page is so vital, it's so necessary. I do a lot of work with higher education and um, a lot of times there's like these, there's sort of the decision about what content is important based on politics, which is important and it's not something that should be ignored. But the reality is that we're building user experiences and some pages of content, like they don't ever get visited. And so, um, not that they shouldn't be there, but there should be some attention paid to how much resources you pour into things, and it should be based on facts. So highly recommend doing an automated report, um, getting an audit, and then and analyzing that information, comparing it against um, real data. Talked earlier really about um, the fact that you should try to do this during scoping. If you don't do it during scoping, discovery. But this should be done, if, you have, if you're on a project right now and you're like getting ready to do content integration and this hasn't been done yet, it is still a good time to do it. So uh, this is one of my favorites. We're gonna talk about message architecture. And a message architecture, uh, essentially when it's delivered, is a, uh, it's a hierarchy of communication goals. Earlier I talked about um, uh, the, the, the Curiosity Rover, which something which is to me is really interesting because I'm like a real science nerd and it's, it's sort of inspires wonder. Um, but the thing that was really interesting from a content strategy perspective about the Curiosity Rover is that it had this voice that was very approachable and friendly and all that stuff. And where that guidance comes from for copywriters is from a message architecture. It should be done during discovery or design, but it can be done at any time. And the reason why we do it is to learn more about the brands that we are representing and, and collaborating with. There's a couple of different ways to do a message architecture. I'm going to go ahead and say that both of these come from Margot Bloomstein's book. There's a link to it up on the resources page. I highly recommend it. It's called Content Strategy at Work. Um, and, and what I'm going, to, I'm going to sort of describe briefly how you do both of the varieties of, of uh, cards or message architecture activity as described in Margot's book. The first one is the card sort. And what we do during a card sort is we have this, this big deck of index cards. Um, we do it during a, a discovery session or a strategy session. And what we do is we spread out all those index cards on a table and we invite our, our stakeholders into the room. And there's three special cards and they say who we are, who we'd like to be, and who we're not. And what we do is we ask them to sort all of the cards into those three columns. Um, and then when we're done with that, we ask them to sort of clean it up. And what I've noticed is that um, what happens to stakeholders is they'll have these three columns and then there's just this big blob of cards underneath it. And they're like, this kind of feels like who we are, but maybe it's who we'd like to be. And so we ask them to sort of clean that up and then remove the who we're not column, right? It's not that it's unimportant, but it's not, it's not uh, pertinent at this point. So we sort all the cards into three columns, remove who we're not. Then we confirm the remaining two columns, who we are and who we'd like to be. And then we remove who we are, right? And then prioritize what remains and record. And I'm gonna come back to what we do with this next in a minute, but then I wanna talk about what the other activity you can do. Um, and by the way, you could do this or the other one, which is the Venn diagram approach, or you could do both, right? Uh, we recently did it for the CMS myth and we did both and it was interesting to see how things worked out. In the Venn diagram approach, 
This is a little bit different. We don't give them index cards with words written on them, with adjectives written on them. We give them two circles on the, on the whiteboard. One says brand attributes and the other one says audience needs. And we ask them to either use markers to write whatever words come to mind up in those circles or in this case I use sticky notes. Um, this is supposed to be a quicker, sort of less uh, difficult way to do things. Um, what we ask them to do is place emotive words in the brand attribute circle first and then place emotive words in the audience needs circle um, and then explore the overlap and, and record the overlap. Hopefully that's the sweet spot. When uh, after, so now we're moving on to the next step as the project manager or the content strategist or the moderator, what you would do with this recording is take those prioritized communication goals and put them into a message architecture, which is a deliverable that you could share with your stakeholders. In the case of the CMS myth, we discovered that the, the way that we want to be perceived by our audience is contrarian. We're provocative, but we're, we're also optimistic. We want to be empowering and provide tools and inspire action. Um, we, we like to be innovative. Um, it was really interesting. There was a lot of conversation about what's the difference between leading edge and bleeding edge and cutting edge, which, I mean, it seems like navel gazing, but really it was an interesting conversation and it helped us understand as a group of content writers, you know, who we are. Um, and that we want to be egalitarian and build community. Um, the other part of this is the, the design implications and the copy implications. So one of the things I, I really love about a message architecture is that this, doesn't, this isn't just about content. This is about design. And it, it's, it's an exercise that's going to help your designers out a lot. So for us, the design implications were that it was OK to use the popular memes for imagery. You shouldn't use stock photo of people in offices. Everybody hates that. What kinds of fonts we could use, et cetera, et cetera. So message architecture isn't just about content strategy. It's something that it's, this is information that's very valuable to designers. And I, I highly recommend it. Also, have some copy implications. Does anyone have eyes on root color? <laughs> That's awesome. Um, couple of pro tips. When you do a message architecture, set up the room in advance. Like I said earlier, this is something you would do during a strategy session or a discovery session. Highly recommend doing it in the morning when everyone's well caffeinated. Get the chairs out of the way. This is something that's meant to be active and people should be up and moving around. Provide snacks and refreshment. Write the ground rules on the whiteboard. In the case of the last time I did this, the ground rules were that this is about the brand. And that's actually a really important distinction. You don't want people to slip into the idea that they're writing who we are as operational goals. They're really writing about who they are in terms of brand attributes, how, the, how the, the, their audiences perceive them. That was the second rule, perception equals reality. Um, it was really about how, the, how we want the audience to perceive us <coughs> and, and that it was a safe environment. If you're uh, working with stakeholders that have sort of different positions within the organizational hierarchy, it's a good idea to let people know when you're doing these kinds of exercises that you're trying to discover where the conflict is. And, and that's actually a rule that could apply to any exercise that you do with, with your various stakeholders. Conflict is OK if it's done in a healthy way. So the next thing we'll talk about is migration planning. Earlier, we, 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 you know, I had the slide with the birds and the ultralight plane and how it, you know, sometimes it can lead to a, a train wreck when you don't plan properly for migration. This is uh, documents that detail the effort associated with content integration. The right time to do it is during design or development. And the reason why we do it is because migration is hard. So some more spreadsheet here for you. Um, I want to talk about this, talk about the columns a little bit. I know they're very difficult to see. Um, the first one is, uh, it's called page number. And this is a system that we use at iSight. Um, essentially what we like to do is come up with a unique identifier for every page that we're going to be dealing with. And by the way, the last spreadsheet I talked about was a content audit. That was the way things are. This is a content migration plan. This is the way things are going to be. So that's a very important distinction. The, the content audit informs what's up here, but this is, a, this is definitely a different a different deliverable. The second column is the page name, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the fourth column is the content source. So what we're doing there is we're letting the copy uh, or the content specialists that are eventually going to be responsible for entering this, perhaps manually keying it into the system. We're figuring out in advance where the copy is going to be, where the content's going to be, and providing them with information about that. Um, so 
uh, in matrix organizations where you know your, your content integration person may be rolling into the team well after design and development and a lot of these decisions have been made, this is a really valuable tool to give them this kind of information. Um, owner, the fifth column is owner. So who is the person that makes the decision about whether or not an individual piece of content is ready to be published? I can't stress enough how important that is. Um, it's probably gonna be an executive stakeholder or uh, your project manager on the client side or whoever it is, somebody is responsible and is the person who has the authority to decide when a piece of copy is ready uh, to, to be published. And so you wanna know who that is. Uh, the sixth column there, I think, one, two, three, four, five, six, is template type. Uh, in Drupal, we call this content type. Um, Karen talked earlier about this, this battle between blobs and chunks. Or, you know, we, a lot of us refer to it as structured content. Um, it's not really a, uh, that, the idea of structured content and content type, particularly for people in the Drupal community, is not a new idea, right? We've been dealing with this for a long time. And when uh, a content person that's going to be integrating or putting this content into the system comes along, it's a great idea to let them know what content type each of these rows is. By the way, in case it's not immediately evident, each row is a node in, 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 in the system or the experience that we're creating. I'm not going to go through all the rest of them. Um, there's a lot of, uh, they essentially uh, events structured content that could be different from project to project, whether, uh, you know, in your case, meta information might be very important. It may be necessary to create a column for every image that's going to be within a structured content type or video files or whatever it is. A lot of that is custom, um, custom generated. However, what's off the screen, I do want to talk about, I couldn't fit it in there, um, is workflow, right? So we all know that when we deliver this new content management system, there's going to be some kind of workflow associated with receiving content, putting it into the system, deciding whether or not it's ready to be published. Um, and this is part of the, the, the risk of not understanding the difficulty of creating content. So I found it's very useful to start to uh, enforce the concept of workflow early and often. Before you ever turn the CMS over to your, to your uh, content people, Get them used to the idea that there's a workflow. So try to find out early what that workflow is going to be, put it into the content migration plan, and try to, try to make use of it. Um, Karen talked about this again earlier, structured content versus blobs. Um, if your, uh, the, the folks that you're working with that are generating the copy don't have a system, if they come to you and they say, hey, listen, we're going to be writing copy while you're building this site. Where do you want us to write it? I get this question all the time. Do you want us to write it in Word? Do you want us to like, what do you want us to do? I'll, ideally, if you can rapidly prototype a Drupal system that has the structured content in it, that's great. But if you can't, and they have to write in Word, or if for whatever reason they want to write in Word, or, or whatever you know the, the word processor of their choice is, it's a really great idea to create a template for them to follow. This is just an example. <clears throat> it could be anything. It's obviously going to be custom for your specific needs. All of these fields should be associated um, with the, in, the attributes of a structured content type. <clears throat> so migration planning pro tips, start early and update often. Like I said earlier, be informed by genuine workflow. Let stakeholders know that this is a living document. It doesn't get finished. Um, and, and so that also uh, touches on another concept that it's not really super pertinent to the idea of content strategy and project management, but something I'd like to talk about, it's an adjacency. Um, when you are sharing deliverables with folks, it's a good idea to use some mechanism or some approach that allows you to have version control so everybody knows what the most recent document is. You could use anything you want. I happen to like Basecamp. Some people use SharePoint. Whatever it is, make sure that when you're sharing deliverables with people that everyone knows what's the most recent version. Um, this spreadsheet right here, it's going to change often, particularly once the migration starts, because one of those columns says, is this done? And people are checking it off. And so you want to make sure that everyone that's working on this um, has the most recent information. Have a sign-off column. Talked about that. So you know, some way to indicate that a piece of content has moved from point A to point B is a really great idea. Um, CMS governance documents. This is a documentation of the rules and vital information associated with the CMS you're turning over. Great time, to, the right time to do this is development. No earlier, how are you gonna tell people what the rules are if the system hasn't been built yet? Um, the purpose of doing this is self-preservation. If you're a project manager 
and you have any expectation of ever getting away from the constant phone calls after you've delivered a system to someone, it's a good idea to have a document that outlines things like hosting information, who to call for support, who to call for content management, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is, by the way, the owner's manual. CMS governance is the owner's manual. The next thing we'll talk about is user documentation. This is a how-to manual. The right time to do it again is during development. The reason for doing this is self-preservation, but it's also for what, if anybody's ever heard of Seth Gottlieb, he's a, he's a blogger in our industry, talks about portfolio rot. Um, in addition to just handing over a document, like a PDF document that says, this is how you put a news item into your CMS, it's a really good idea to give your stakeholders tools. So if your designer had a, a Photoshop file that they used to create the treatments of images that show up in those big, beautiful uh, hero banners that show up on the homepage carousel, turn that over to your client. Give them the tools that they need um, in order to, to, to be successful, and they, they will love you for it. So that's it. Uh, the seven ways content can choke out your project. Failure to understand scope, failure to respect the content, failure to plan for content creation, failure to design with real copy, failure to plan for content migration, plan for your new CMS, and failure to understand business needs. Six things you can do to mitigate these risks. Hire a content strategist, conduct a content audit, create a message architecture, do migration planning, write documentation, uh, and uh, who won those t-shirts? I tweeted to all the winners. Excellent. Maybe when you're done with questions, you can just have them come up here. Come see John if you're looking for your t-shirt, and uh, what'd you think? Go to this website and evaluate, and uh, does anyone have any questions? So the organizers asked me to be sure that if you have a question that you go to the microphone because the session's being recorded. I hope that doesn't discourage anyone from, from asking a question. So while people are coming up for questions, just in case you didn't see the tweets, the winners are, and these are Twitter handles, not names, Quiller C, Duo Consulting, O'Brien Editorial, World of T, and CNEY26, which I don't know how to pronounce, so. <laughs> -E. Hi there. Hello. So as much as we as project managers love a good content audit spreadsheet and a good content migration spreadsheet, clients hate them. <laughs> How in your experience have you been able to get better adoption using those types of very necessary tools? That's a great question. So um, what I try to do uh, is explain the long-term value of them. Um, and that doesn't always work, believe me, I know. Um, I have one client right now that they just, they don't think that they've come to us for any assistance with anything that doesn't have to do with designing images or designing interface and, and building the site. Um, but most of the time, particularly now, when we, if I stop and take the time to sit down during the, the project manager kickoff and explain why we're doing these things as opposed to just saying we're going to do them, I find that the adoption uh, rate is better. Hi there. Um, I'm interested in the problem that you mentioned with using lorem ipsum as part of the design. Uh, certainly I can understand that it's a little misleading for people uh, because a lot of what you put in for, for dummy content winds up not really accurately representing what's finally going to be on the website. So that makes sense. But the counterbalance, of course, is that when you show people a design which contains um, content that doesn't make any, or that makes too much sense to them, then the content becomes the focus rather than the design. And Great. the same goes for information architecture and so yeah. on. So how do you balance those problems? That, that's a fantastic question. And it is definitely something that with every single project I wrestle with, um, two, two sides to the answer. One of them is that I, I, I firmly believe that the risk of not using real content for design at this stage in the sort of the development of, of building world-class digital experiences far outweighs the, the sort of headaches that, that you inevitably deal with. The second part is, again, uh, it's, it's over-communicating. So every time um, we go in to present designs to one of our clients, before I say to Andrew, who's the creative director I work with all the time, take it away, um, I give a preamble and I talk about exactly what you just said. We're showing you copy that is your copy. Please do not get hung up on the period being uh, one extra space. Please don't get hung up on the spelling. Please, please, please. I promise you that's all stuff we're going to deal with. What we're trying to do now is events the user experience from a design perspective. And um, 
even though I say that, and even though the clients look at me and nod their head and say, I fully understand, uh, it, it does still lead to problems, and it's just a matter of constantly reinforcing. So um, the, the short answer is over-communication. Thank you. In the uh, messaging exercise that you did, the card sort and the Venn, is there a recommendation that you have for virtual teams doing that when you're not in person? Is there a tool that you could use for that? That, that's another good question. So uh, I, I, without being too cheeky, I'm going to say definitely check out Margot's book because she mentions it. And I just can't remember exactly what her, um, her solution was there. I do remember her saying, if this is something that you can do in person, obviously you're going to get the best experience. and Your clients are going to have the best experience. That being said, um, uh, there's a couple of different tools we use for virtualization. iSight Design is a virtualized company. We have offices in Boston and Portland. Our clients are all over the world. Um, and, and we use um, Adobe Connect for desktop sharing. And uh, we're also starting to play with Google Hangouts. Um, so Thanks. thank you. Hey, you kind of uh, glossed over the, the seven gates for digital change. Can you go into that a little bit more on e each of those? Yeah, absolutely. Let me back up here. So, oh, and by the way, the, all the slides will be up on the resources page. Um, let's see, the seven gates for digital change. So again, the idea here is that we are creating digital experiences um, for our stakeholders, our clients. Um, and you know, one of the things that it's important for me as a project manager to keep in mind, for engineers to keep in mind, for designers and content uh, copywriters, is that we're all small parts of a bigger picture that rolls up uh, to, to the appropriate digital experience. And so um, what we try to do more and more often these days is uh, go in, so uh, ideally clients come to us and they're, they haven't already decided what their solution is. They come to us and they say, I've got a problem, or I, I have goals or aspirations. I don't know how to get there. And so we will start with a strategy engagement that hopefully informs uh, the eventual design team on what they need to do. And we go through that strategy engagement. We try to unearth what's going on behind all of the circles here. So I think, John, do you happen to know what time we have to be out of this room? Uh, you have to look like back to the OK. I just have one question. I'm, I'm a project manager, and I love my content strategist team. And I really resonate with what you're saying when, as PMs, we definitely play therapist. I think that is 70% of my job is being a therapist um, for the client. But can you talk about any tips or tricks that you have when we have to play therapist for our content strategists? <laughs> um, because sometimes there's that bridge that divide that happens between trying to help them also understand the intricacies and issues that we're dealing with with our clients as a therapist. Sorry. So, yeah, no, that's a great question. Therapist for the content strategist. Um, I haven't, I'll be honest in saying, I haven't had to play that role yet. And I think um, one of the things that's interesting about content strategists is that they are taking a more holistic look at the entire experience um, that being said, there are, there are content strategists who are user experience architects, right? Um, and they're user experience architects first, and they tend to take a usability first approach to the problem, which is fine. It's an important uh, angle. Um, but sometimes, all of us as human beings, we, we, have, we can sometimes have a tendency to look at things from a folk, sort of a focused perspective and not see what's going on around here. And so, um, quite often, when there's conflict on a project, regardless of where it's coming from, um, it has it always has to do with some problem in communication, some some lack of communication or some miscommunication at some point. And so, whether it's content strategist, whoever it is on the team that's having difficulties, um, I find that uh, if I can remember not to first like freeze up and then go to my supervisor, who happens to be John, and complain about the problem. <laughs> uh, but if I can try to find a way first to communicate with the folks and try to get everyone together and talking better, it, it always leads to better outcomes. So. Anything else? I'm not quite sure how to phrase this question, but I was wondering if you had any general thoughts on project scale. We deal with a lot of small clients, and we have that problem where the our contact is wearing a, a number of different hats. Yes. And 
even though we try to convey the importance of, of content, they're still coming down to the deadline and they still haven't started working on their content. And um, yeah, just kind of general thoughts on um, dealing dealing with that. And Absolutely. if there's any tools that kind of might make that easier for them, like um, the one of the thoughts that back of my mind is maybe we're not approaching them with the best possible method. That's a, that's a really good question. And it's, it's actually something that's really, for me, was a personal uh, um, difficulty that I went through. I went from being the quote unquote webmaster or web developer for a brick and mortar company in the 90s to working in an agency uh, environment where I've, suddenly it was, I was the team, the web team, and now I was working with web teams. And at first that was difficult. I had a tendency to want to do everything. And I had this attitude of like, you don't need to do that step. You don't need to do that. That's not necessary. Look, I'll show you how to get this done, right? And, uh, you know, I got my nose bloodied a few times before I realized that there was a better way. Um, and a big piece of that uh, coming to terms for me was the knowledge that it, um, every step in the process of getting from an idea that lives in some person's brain to, in our case, an experience that lives up on a web screen or on a mobile device or through Google Glasses is a necessary step in the process. And so the only choice we have really is whether or not we're gonna take each one of these steps. Um, in terms of dealing with smaller teams, the really important key to understand for, for me was that these steps don't have, like I wouldn't use the same size step uh, at Harvard University as I will use for the Cambridge Community Foundation. I'm still going to do a content audit, but it's not going to be a month-long process for the Cambridge Community Foundation like it was for Harvard University, right? It's going to be an abbreviated version of it, but I'm still going to do it, right? And so uh, I guess what I would say is that take a look at ways to make sure you go through each step, um, but see how you can scale them up or down so that it's not too painful for folks. I hope that helps. Anyone else? Awesome. Thank you again so much. This has been a really wonderful experience.